Coming up on today's show. Each of us has these unique talents and gifts. And sometimes I think we think we have to be extraordinary, and we don't. We need to be holy and ordinary. Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net. At the top of the website, there are links to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, so you can engage with me and the show that way. Look for those logos, those links there, for whichever platform or platforms, plural, you enjoy using. A reminder as well about the Catholic Sports Radio community. That is the Facebook group, which is free to join and which you can also find a link for on catholicsportsradio.net. Remember, too, that any and all of those give you the opportunity to contact me as does traditional email, which you can do through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. Someone that I know recently decided to immerse themselves in the world of sports trading cards. Wow, what a big business that has become. There was a report in March that said the sports card industry is expected to reach $49 billion in value by 2032. I remember collecting those when I was a kid, and it made me wonder if posters still hang on bedroom walls of young fans who adore their favorite player. I was shocked when I visited someone's house recently and saw a home office that was more sports memorabilia than it was a work environment. Wow, bobbleheads and other types of figurines and sports collectibles. Now imagine a similar world where instead we are surrounding ourselves with materials to not only celebrate, but learn more about the saints. Sure, we have a prayer card here or there, maybe a mass card from the memorial service for a loved one, but rather than books about sports champions, are we filling our shelves with stories about the men and women who have been canonized? Eight weeks ago, on episode 228, you heard me interview Dave Matheson from Catholic Answers, who has spent a lot of time around Major League Baseball. Catholic Answers says that, quote, The faith of the Church is that the saints are not really dead, but are fully alive in Jesus Christ, who is life itself, citing John 11.25 and John 14.6. And they also note that, quote, The saints are alive in heaven because of the life they have received through their faith in Christ Jesus and through their eating of his body and blood. Because they are alive, we believe that we can go to them to intercede for us with God, end quote. Friends, sports trading cards are fun, but our faith life is serious business. Let us look to the men and women who have been enshrined eternally in our continued path to be with our Father in heaven. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest is a member of the founding family of the defending Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs and is also the owner of the Kansas City Mavericks, a franchise member of the ECHL. In addition, he is the founder of the Loretto Foundation, LLC, a private charitable organization. He also serves as interim president for St. Michael the Archangel High School in Lee's Summit, Missouri, and on the board of directors of Hunt Midwest and the Bright Futures Fund. He has also served on the board of Dynamic Catholic for many years. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Lamar Hunt, Jr. Thank you so much. appreciate you asking me. Absolutely, Lamar. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Since I mentioned the words founding family in the intro, share with us about where you grew up as well as the faith that you were raised in, because later we're going to hear that you eventually converted to Catholicism. But let's start with your childhood first. Uh, Yeah, I was raised in Dallas, Texas. Um, I don't mind saying I was born in 1956. And um, Obviously, growing up in our family, uh, my dad founded the American Football League, was one of the founders of it, and we, or he obviously had the, the Dallas Texans franchise, so at a very early age, we were exposed to all things sports, 
and um, we were a family in the Methodist Church, but I went to a, an Episcopal boys' school from grades three through twelve in Dallas, Texas, called St. Mark's. Mm, okay. And uh, great, great life experience there, just with longtime friendships to this day, and uh, so many opportunities. Wow, wow! You were, in fact, an athlete, but a much better musician. Explain that, especially given the pressure that we would all guess you'd feel to go the sports route, what with being in a sports-minded family. Yeah, I, I played uh, I played sports and I enjoyed it, and I was you know I was I was a good good at, at football and very adequate at track, mainly because the football coaches said you need to go run hurdles; it'll help your footwork in football. Mm. <laughs> But going to an all boys school and it was a private school, you had the opportunity to take to be to be involved in things like music. And it just turned out I took to the flute at an early age, about fourth grade, and I just it just seemed to be natural at it. In fact I still enjoy playing the flute to this day and wow. I actually pursued a a degree in uh music at the University of Cincinnati after I graduated from high school and did some professional flute playing for a, a good while until I sort of transitioned to business and being able to kind of do some things with my dad uh, in my late 30s and early 40s, which was a, a blessing. But yeah, music has always been my uh, lifelong uh, ta- uh, passion, if you will, a gift. Uh, I call it a gift. And I do think ultimately it, it was maybe responsible in some ways, uh, classical music that is, although I love popular music as well, that um, helped me look at the world in a different way and hear the world in a different way and see the truth, goodness, and beauty of God and, and ultimately the Catholic church. So I, I do think that was instrumental to use a pun (laughs) in my transition. (laughs) But you know, audience, isn't it interesting because as much as my ministry is all about the intersection of faith and sports and showing everyone how they do go together, clearly we all know about the music ministry, and so certainly there is a path there for sure, as Lamar just hinted at. Lamar, you received the Elizabeth Ann Seton Award for Catholic Education. Can you talk about that, as well as St. Michael and Catholic Education in general? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, after I converted to the Catholic faith, and I would credit just a lot of things with that, music being one of them, the beauty of classical music, um, I guess I I started to see the richness of the Catholic faith, the depth of the Catholic faith, the the broad scope of the Catholic faith and how it just encompasses so much and the the teaching of the Catholic faith and just what it can give to us. And so I'm a sort of self-learner, self-starter that way, have done a lot of reading over the years and uh, obviously sent our kids to Catholic schools and just... I'm very grateful to this day for that Catholic education that I got to see my children get. Plants a lot of seeds, and so seeds blossom at different times in lives. I see that with my own children, and they have to go through their own struggle and their own walk to the Lord and walk with the Lord. But for me, the interest in Catholic education said, listen, this is so important because the single greatest gift you can give, I think, another human being or a child or a young person is introducing them to a relationship with God. And mm. that's a little bit of the evangelizing that people talk about. Um, and it's just so important to just be able to say, here's an introduction, you know, and God, yes, he's divine, but he's also so real because of his son. The humanity is so real of, of Christ. So you have that combination of the divine and the human, and it's just so wonderful, and it's just the fullness of the fullness of Christianity, I think, is found in the Catholic faith and church. There are a lot of guests who come on this show that are converts to the faith, and we'll talk about some watershed moment that led them to convert to Catholicism, and we heard a little bit about the music, but I'm curious, Lamar, when did you convert to the Catholic faith, and was it organic? Was it just kind of a transition that you've been describing? Because Parallel to that, were you the only one from your family that converted to Catholicism? Uh, yeah, from my family, I'm the only Catholic. Um, I was age 34, and I think it—I think some of it had to do with my oldest daughter, who is now 40. She was going to receive her first communion, and 
um, was going to church, but, you know, just didn't, went in different places and listened in different places and finally read a book by Father John Hardin called The Catholic Catechism. And he's a Jesuit priest who I think is his cause for canonization is underway. And I just remember reading the book and it was just so well written. And I, I had a rapport a little bit with the Jesuit or Ignatian spirituality. It just made a lot of sense to me. Mm. And uh, I remember closing the book saying, where do I sign up for the RCIA? And part of the motivation was my daughter was going to be receiving her first communion and um, went through instructions and had a wonderful sponsor who had 11 children. And one of those children is a Catholic priest here in Kansas City area in Liberty, Missouri. And her name was Helen Roach. And um, she was wonderful in the classes, very direct with the instructor. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so I was able to convert. And But I mean, there, you know, there are different watershed moments, but I think I think I was starting to recognize in my life, and this is my biggest belief about our Lord, is he's a healer. And there was something within me that needed healing. Um, yes, we're all sinful, but we all have different things that we've grappled with or wrestled with. Um, nothing is new to God. Nothing is new under the sun. But there were just things that, you know, needed resolution in my life. And it's then I started to realize that's a, that's a lifelong journey. And that's the beauty of the Catholic faith is tripping, falling, stumbling, getting off the trail, getting off into the cactus, <laughs> thorns and all the, but the, 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 the sacrament of confession and coupled with the Eucharist, you know, just receiving that grace through those two, two specific sacraments, I think has just um, given me that, that walk with the Lord and, and hopefully uh, on the road to sanctity, the path of holiness. Amen. Amen. And, Folks, I couldn't help but conjure up images in my head as Lamar was talking about stumbling, about falling, about getting back up. You see that it really could be a football player that he's describing, right? That's trying to get better, that's trying to improve their game, that's trying to further their career. Maybe they have a case of the yips, as they call it. They're fumbling. They maybe go down a little too soon, whatever the case is. They're trying to get better at what they really believe strongly. And so in our Catholic faith, we do find that we fall, but... Praise God, we do get back up, and we do have the sacraments that Lamar's talking about. And Lamar, my prayer is always that this show is helping people in their faith life, and there's an experience you had that I'm sure will be something that some folks in the audience can use in their walk. You have been through a divorce and an annulment in the Catholic Church, and you say that that goes along with healing. Can you share those insights, please? Uh, yes. Uh, was blessed to be married and her name was Jocelyn and um, the marriage did not, it did not make it. And, um, you know, that was, it was, it's a death without a burial going through a divorce, but by the grace of God and, and the great advice by spiritual directors, they just said, work on your relationship with your children, maintain that and mm. see what God has in store. Sure enough, he put before me a woman named Rita, my wife now of 20 years but there was things you had to do, and that was work through the annulment process. And the reason I say that is because you have to own what your contribution was to the failed marriage, if you will, if you mm. call it that. And that, that's what the annulment did. I mean, I, I can still remember to this day there were 42 questions, um, and I had a, a wonderful advocate, but... Still, the advocate said, you're not retrying the case. You are taking, you're learning from what you went through because there's going to be that desire, urge, maybe gift of, of getting remarried, and you don't want to bring that into the new marriage. And there's some accountability. And I had accountability for sure, absolutely, things that I contributed to to the failure of the marriage. And once you own it, and then you heal from it, and some of that healing involves great spiritual direction, um, and some of that involves just working with a very wonderful psychologist to kind of reset your compass in life and say, wait a minute, you know, you believe this, but is that really true? <laughs> I remember one of those questions, is that really true? <laughs> and um, and so both my wife and I, Rita, we went through the annulment process. And um, I remember at one point, I'll just say this very quickly, um, 
I wanted to ask her to get engaged, and I went to a priest who's Jesuit, and he looked up and he goes, well, have you finished your annulment? I said, no, I'm waiting for the determination, but, you know, and he goes, that would be the sin of presumption. You mm. are to wait until the annulment is finalized to make any next moves. And uh, Father Haney, he's uh, there's Father Haney Avenue uh, near Jesuit High School in St. Rita Church in Dallas, Texas, and I'm just, he was very direct, but very challenging, and um, I'm grateful to him. May he rest in peace. He's um, just a, was a wonderful confessor. So, but those, those, that, that experience, that whole experience of you're, you're, you're held accountable. You do need to look at your contribution individually, and you need to look at healing. That's what the Lord offers, and um, forgiveness, and obviously there's resentment and bitterness that things that, that come through those types of situations of really taking that walk with the Lord and letting him free you from that stuff. Wow. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful insights. Thank you so much for for opening up and sharing all that in the audience. I know that that's going to help someone out there, and praise God for that. I, I know, by the way, audience, that you're clamoring for me to ask Lamar all about the Chiefs and talk more about sports with him, but <laughs> praise God for his witness that we do have this opportunity to learn from his experiences away from the field of play or the ice, in the case of the Mavericks, as we all work to move deeper in our faith life. That's the aim of my ministry, and I'm humbled to be able to sit in this seat and be a vessel for you to be touched by the testimony from my guests week in and week out, month after month for four and a half years now. Truly the Holy Spirit is present in these conversations that you're hearing each week on Catholic Sports Radio. I am, however, just a one-person operation, and I don't get any income from doing this show, nor do I have any sponsors. So as much as I want to grow the audience and touch more lives through my ministry, it unfortunately comes with some limitations. I was talking to someone who I highly respect recently. His wife has a podcast that is over-the-top successful. She is, for all intents and purposes, making a full-time job from podcasting. And when I asked him how the profile of her podcast has gotten so high, he told me about a service that is quite, quite, quite expensive. Since I have to try to find a way out of my own pocket to cover the various costs that come with doing this show, that's far too much for me to try to take on. If you feel you're getting value from what I do through this ministry and would like to help me grow the show, reach a bigger audience, and be in community with one another so that others can have their faith life touched by the stories my guests are sharing, when you evaluate the tithing that you're doing, I would greatly appreciate if you would kindly consider my Catholic Sports Radio ministry. If you're getting enjoyment from listening to this show, I ask that you kindly help me out by way of the blue Donate to CSR button on the homepage of catholicsportsradio.net. Through that button on the website, you can contribute whatever amount you're comfortable with by way of simply typing it in yourself, meaning you're not forced to choose from a list of predetermined amounts. Alternatively, as some have done instead, you can get in touch with me via social media or email me through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net and I will write you back with details on sending a check through the mail. As a thank you to anyone who contributes, regardless of the amount, I will happily say your name on an upcoming episode, with your permission, as you've heard me do in the past for guests and listeners alike who have made a gift to my ministry. Or if some have asked me to do, you can choose to remain anonymous, in which case I will give a generic on-air thank you without naming names. Your support of my work really means a lot to me. I'm grateful for you listening and for considering Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing. Lamar, I do want to give the people what they want, as the saying goes. So if I were to ask you about your most cherished sports memory, is it safe to assume that it would be a Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl championship? Actually, no. Um, I mean, we're so grateful for the last, actually, five years and five AFC championship games held in Kansas City and the two Super Bowl victories and even the one Super Bowl loss, which was heartbreaking. But if I had to put something in, in perspective, it would be seeing Yvonne Goulagong win Wimbledon mm. when she was 19 years old. I was in England traveling with my dad. My dad was involved in the world of professional tennis. Um, hard to believe I got kind of turned loose. I was probably, I think I was 13 or 14 years old to see 70. I think she won that in 71 ish, 72 ish. 
Um, but anyway, um, there was just this buzz. I would hear people talking about this Aboriginal girl, uh, Yvonne Goulagong, amazing talent. Didn't you know? And I was just captivated and got to see her play. And on, I believe it was consecutive days, she beat uh, Billie Jean King and Margaret Court to win at age 19, and she thumped them. And subsequently, I had some curiosity. And this is really the point of the story about how this came to be, you know, Aborigines and things like that. They were somewhat outcasts, obviously, in Australia. And she had reflected that she grew up one of eight children. And she, uh, her father was a sheep shearer and her mother was illiterate. And they lived up outside of the community. But in Australia, there's tennis courts here and there everywhere, kind of like there's football fields here in America everywhere, <laughs> soccer fields. <laughs> He would go down and watch kids on these public tennis courts or these courts play tennis. She's seven, eight years old, something like that. And after a certain point in time, the coach looked up at her and said four words, come have a hit. You can hear the accent even. And so that simple invitation, walking around the fence and coming onto the court changed her life because her her gift was apparent quite quickly by the age of 14 um, that he had provided a way for her to be, in a sense, adopted by a family into the bigger city. But she got a formal education with the understanding that, you know, she might be using that formal education in her life, you know. But then she wins a, a youth title when she's like 17. And there's projections that she's going to be a very, very good tennis player. But, you know, it'll be in her 20s. Well, at 19, she blossoms. And um, she, she reflected later. She said, I never really experienced prejudice as such, but I knew we were somewhere outside the culture, but I got invited mm. into it. And to this day, she works with those, those families and children and things like that in her own way. She's also, I think, the only woman in women's tennis to his married, lifelong marriage, which is a beautiful gift, that have ch have children and come back and win a title. Hmm. Um, and she beat, she beat Chris Everett, I think. I think she won Wimbledon in 72, and then I think she turned around, and by 1983, she'd beaten Chris Everett again. So that's an amazing person. And what, what makes it a most memorable sports memory is not only the backstory, but just the electricity, the enthusiasm, the joy of the people had there in England – Seeing somebody kind of from the outside come in and just do it with such grace and beauty. And so that's, in a sense, my most cherished live sports memory. Yes, of course, the Chiefs is near and dear to our hearts, um, and it represents so much for the Kansas City community. <laughs> but I, I always, I just, it, I, I just remember it so vividly and, and just riding the the trains or the subways there and, and things like that and walking the grounds at Wimbledon. I was kind of freelancing because my dad was in meetings and who would think of four, I think I was 14 now, uh, who, who would think of, you know, 14, 15 year old, whatever it is, would just be let go like that mm -hmm. nowadays. You'd be kind of cautious. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, that's it. Clearly, this that experience had an impact on you, and praise God for the fact that you did see it the way that you just described. I know you feel strongly about the necessity of a prayer life. We heard in the intro some of the many different hats that you're wearing, the Chiefs, the Kansas City Mavericks hockey team, the St. Michael the Archangel High School, so many other things that you're doing. I would love to hear, in your own words, your own experience, your own practice in terms of a prayer life, especially since you are pulled in so many different directions. Very much dedicated, if, if at all possible, and it's generally very possible to go to daily mass and to chew, if you will, on the, the daily gospel. Certainly the Old Testament, it can be part of that. I mean, we've been going through the book of Exodus over the last few weeks, and there's plenty to, to ponder there. So, Letting that shape my day, I'm a very strong devotee of adoration and or just time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. So, um, in fact, I have a time today from 4 to 5 at our parish that I've committed to on Wednesdays. But I also have other times. I mean, I'm in a Catholic school. There's a chapel. I can just spend time sitting in his presence and um, pondering, thinking, reflecting on 
your own personal life. I mean, each of us has these unique talents and gifts, and sometimes I think we think we have to be extraordinary, and we don't. Mm. We need to be holy in the ordinary, um, very much holy, just find holiness in the ordinary. How am I speaking to my lovely wife? How am I interacting with my children? Am I, I'm a grandparent now. We're grandparents now. Are we investing the time to just be with them? Uh, I have a granddaughter who's uh, going to be a sophomore in high school. So some of it is mental prayer of just how you're going to plan your time and this word presence. So where does God want me to be present? And I think we can get pulled in a lot of different directions. I'm a little older now. It's a little easier to say, I can't be there. I can't do it. In some ways, there's a relief that I don't feel like I have to be, you know, constantly on, 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 here, here, there, there. Mm -hmm. Um, The charities, the things that we identify, spend a lot of time in prayer about those things. But I think that visiting the Blessed Sacrament, obviously receiving the Eucharist, but visiting Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament or through adoration, you're in silence, you're in solitude, you're there face to face with eternity, with the God who created you and his son who knows what you're dealing with. Mm. And that's it's so personal. But, but, the, and then I, you know, the other thing I would just add is the daily rosary, if at all possible, I, I find that helps just um, calm me down. Um, you don't need to be sitting in front of the TV or the radio all the time doing stuff mm-hmm. or on your phone. Um, just being able to, to, to have that interior life, I think, is so important. Everything is so much outside of us now, and there's so much running around. I heard you talk about the, the uh, collecting of sports cards and things like that. Of how do we use our resources and time? So, yeah. Mm, so beautiful. So beautiful. You mentioned before about the trip to England for Wimbledon. In sports, we hear about road trips when teams are playing away games, but in your case, share with us about a pilgrimage you did to Israel. Well, that was wonderful. It was through the Holy Family School of Faith here in Kansas City, which is a wonderful ministry. Uh, Mike Scherslick is the executive director, president. I'm not sure what his title is, but there, there's a daily podcast. <laughs> to, 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 uh, there are a lot of things of, of the rosary and reflections, but this was, uh, you know, we got to go, and it was really... It was a trip that was focused on the New Testament, and he even told us that early. But we had about 100 people. I believe there were three Catholic priests, a wonderful guide who I believe was, I want to say he was maybe a Byzantine Rite um, Christian. You know, I'm not, I'm not always sure about all the delineations. But we had a wonderful guide, wonderful trip, and, and just walking where the Lord walked, and seeing all that. In fact, one time I mentioned it was New Testament. Off in the distance was the Dead Sea, and, and, and everybody goes, let's go there, let's go there. And they said, no, this is the New Testament. We won't be visiting the Dead Sea. <laughs> was but, but the Stations of the Cross, seeing where our Lord was crucified and buried, you know, the theater that everything happened in was, that's what I didn't realize, how small, if you want to call it that, the theater, the drama of the Gospels was very limited, and that shows you the impact we can have just by the being around the people that we're around. That's our theater. And our Lord, he didn't try to start a podcast, <laughs> no offense, or he didn't have a, you know, he certainly had the ability to know about television and all that sort of stuff, but he chose to do it sort of on foot. And I'll mention one other thing quickly. The most moving thing and the most moving piece of the scriptures for me is the meeting the woman at the well. And, um, you know, she has the five husbands, and the way I would look at it or the way it's been, it's come down to me is she had a lot of baggage in her life. And you don't even mention that maybe she had children by different men as well. Who knows? But he encounters her. We got to go to that site, and it was the heat of the day, as the Scripture describes, because this was in June. It was so bloody hot, and there, you know, I can just, we could just sit there, and uh, I don't know if it was a priest or Mike Scherzler, they just walked us through what happened at that moment. And ever since then, that scripture has impacted me so much by just the idea of unfolding of here's this woman just carrying all this stuff and hurt and pain and anguish and confusion on her. And he just takes that baggage and lifts it off her. And in the Greek Orthodox tradition, she is called Saint Fotini. She is a saint. 
uh, P-H-O-T-I-N-I. I have a Greek Orthodox friend. He told me that recently. So they've named her, and she's a marvelous evangelist. And I think that's what we want to go tell people is, the Lord healed me in these ways. I'm not perfect, but he changed my life. And that's what she does. Mm-hmm. And we need to do that, be that imitation as well. We're in the home stretch here, and I just have a couple of final questions. I do want to make sure before I let you go that first I give you a chance to talk about being a pro-life advocate. Yeah, I would, my first marriage, I had seven children. Beautiful. And uh, my mother would have had 10 children. She had some miscarriages and in, in, uh, stillborn. So, uh, you know, we, we, we just grew up at a time when people had big families. I tell people this, my father's father and my mother's father— my father's father is the youngest of nine children. My mother's father was the youngest of 10 children. So if Sarah or Elizabeth, those are those names of my great-grandmothers, say, eh, no, I'm done, I've had enough, I'm not sitting here talking to you, at mm. least not this. So that's, that's an incredible story. They were all Protestants. So there's an openness to life that streams down through our family. But the, the pro-life to me is just very much an important thing. And, and you hear this phrase a lot, the dignity of the human person. But we all began as, some, as a child of God in our mother's womb, created in the image of God. And so it's so important for us to see that. And I think the, the, the challenge here is to meet these women, again, like the women at the well, they're carrying a lot of difficulties and baggage. And if we, I've come to this realization recently, we waste so much money in our culture on political initiatives and things like that. What if we just met every woman and said, listen, we can provide you with safety, a place to stay, and we're going to help you get to the next step in life. Maybe the relationship can work out. Maybe um, we can help you with your next journey on the work path, right? These different things, it wouldn't cost that much money, but we're wasting so many resources when we could be meeting women where they're at in the state of incredible vulnerability and fear. And that's why they make that decision oftentimes is that they're just scared and abandoned. Mm -hmm. And that's very scary for a woman. I understand that, right? And so being pro-life is not necessarily, yes, you want her to make that choice for the child, but being pro-life is saying, okay, we want to find an environment to help you flourish, to be everything that God wants you to be. In the words of dynamic Catholic, to be the best version of yourself. Amen. Amen. So we we try to support those those ministries that are pro-life, just just saving a life here and there if we can. You've mentioned a few times, but it's tradition for me to close this way. The Lord has certainly called you to a life as a husband, a father, and a grandfather. Can you just share with us a little bit more about your time in the Sacrament of Holy Matrimony with your wife, Rita, as well as the large family that the two of you have made? Well, we, when we went through marriage prep, we had a wonderful couple— and by golly, I need to go back and find their names and maybe go thank them. They, they had— gone through divorce, and they, they had blended a family, and they gave us such wisdom and advice. I'm not going to give you all the points because we've lived it all, but they, they, basically, they, they basically said, listen, you've got to support each other. There's going to be times when there'll be divisiveness or confusion or these sorts of things. And so what this couple did was prepped us on how to blend a family. And so my, my wife is affectionately called Smom by my children, S-M-O-M, and she has a great relationship with the children. And now, they're, I mean, the youngest is now 27 and the oldest is 40. But she, she was a mom, a dedicated mom, and, and, and she took on a role that was not easy, very, very difficult. And so we pray with each other. We go to Mass together. We just are able to communicate. It, it, really, in marriage, one of the biggest challenges is just simply sitting down and having a conversation with each other and not getting defensive. You know, it's so easy to feel like the other person is attacking you personally, but just to say, let's just share some ideas on how we can do this. And that's, I think, the fruit of our, our marriage is just being able to sit down and plan things together and work through things together. And uh, one quick example, we've done the last two 
springs, breaks. We've had all the kids that we can and grandkids in one place in Florida. You know, we just rent a place for a week. And we finally have looked at each other and said, we can't do this anymore. We're just going to, you know, if we pick a place, they can come in ships. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's overwhelming. It really is. And I think it is for them, too. You know, you're trying to split time and all these sorts of things. And they've got their own family that they're dealing with. And so just being able to sit down and talk through, frankly, hey, this isn't working, that's such a practical in any marriage of just being able to communicate without wounding each other. And couples, sometimes they say, th- we all say things to our spouses that are they are mean or cruel or insensitive. That's why we have um, confession, <laughs> but, but which is so helpful. But that, that, that to me would be the main thing is just having that conversation. We are created for relationship and good conversation. Well, Lamar, back in February, the day before the Super Bowl, my guest was Father Sean Loomis, and he talked about all the parishioners that were coming into church wearing Eagles colors and praying for their team. We all know that they came out on the wrong side, but I know there's a lot of Chiefs fans who will be listening, and they'll be offering up their prayers now that training camp is starting. So all the best to to you and the team, and first and foremost, thank you so much for your time on Catholic Sports Radio, and God bless you and your family. It's been wonderful having you on. Well, just thank you for your ministry, and I love to hear the pitch about supporting your ministry, and I think this is a wonderful thing. I will say one thing very, very quickly. I know a lot of young people today listen to podcasts. That's how they get their information. So for anyone out there, anything you can do to disseminate the beautiful uh, conversations that go on in this type of a podcast, please help out. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lamar. Thank you so much. And again, I appreciate your time. And folks, let's close this week's episode with our sportsman's prayer and do it together, of course, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with our minds, our spirits, and our bodies. Help us always to be good sports. Help us to understand that when we put on the team uniform, we are first and foremost ambassadors of the Catholic faith. May we always remember that those with whom we play and compete are our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we always treat each other with dignity and respect. May our work and play always give you honor and glory. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those, C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose. <laughs>